We are recording. Hello and welcome to Bring On the PED, otherwise known as Personal Electronic Devices. You could also say Bring Your Own Technology. Some people don't like calling it Bring Your Own Technology because you're saying BYOT, which sounds very much like BYO something else. And then you start wondering what kind of classes you're actually teaching. Since I teach middle school, you know, whatever. I still call it BYOT, but um, there you go. My name is Aaron Smith. Uh, my website is aaronbsmith.com. I actually have multiple websites, but if you go there, you get links to everything else, including my Twitter account, my Google Plus account. Yes, I use Google Plus. No one else does. I go there and I see tumbleweeds rolling across, but oh well. Um, my website, or like my podcast, my Tumblr account. If, if I'm online somewhere, I have a link to it at that web address. Okay, and that's also where I'm going to be posting this presentation when I'm done recording it. So what you're going to be expecting is I'm going to be talking about what to expect from personal electronic devices, uh, how to plan for it, digital citizenship. I would be remiss if I ever did a presentation on using technology that requires internet use or makes use of internet use without talking about digital citizenship. Uh, the nitty gritty stuff, which is examples of how to do quizzes and tests, classroom management systems or CMS or there's like 15 different acronyms that basically mean the same thing, a website that lets you manage your students and what they're handing in. And QR codes at the end because QR codes are cool. Yay, thank you. Okay, next up, what to expect from personal electronic devices in the classroom? Oh my gosh, isn't this beautiful? Everyone brought the exact same computer in. They're all running the same operating system with the same programs installed. They're all smiling and happy because everything's working. You do have some variety. This guy right here has a different mouse. He has a little race car mouse. And everyone else has a stock black mouse that came with the computer possibly. But a little variety is okay. Everything's gonna be working great, right? No? no? This is more reality. How many smartphones are in that picture? Three. Wrong. Uh, Look at those phones. That's not a smartphone. Oh, yeah. Those are what we call feature phones in the industry, as in they don't have any. <laughs> they used to be called candy bar phones, but candy bar meant that you could possibly eat them, and maybe there were some problems with kindergarten that I don't know about. I used to sell phones. I used to sell, you sell cell. cell phones. Yes, at the seashore. <laughs> uh, my name was not Sally, though. Okay, so you're going to have a wide variety. My school, I just found out the poverty level at my school. I didn't realize it was as high as it was. I'm not going to give the exact percentage because I am recording this to put it online, but it was a lot higher than I thought it was, particularly because I teach in a magnet program. Um, but affluence is not a key factor for getting into a magnet program. They don't look at that as a criteria. Um, there's a lot of kids that don't have phones because their parents can't afford them. There's a lot of kids that don't have computers or internet access. I'm very fortunate. I teach at the K-3 Academy and I actually have technology majors where they have to audition to become a technology major in fifth grade and then I have them for sixth, seventh, eighth grade seeing them every other day teaching technology classes all year long. It's fantastic. Last year I had a major who didn't have internet access at home, who didn't have a computer at home. He could still do the work. He had to do it all in my room. I had other kids that are bringing their own laptops in. That's cool. But you're not going to have everyone bringing something in. So when you hear stuff about, oh, well, we've got BYOT, everyone can bring stuff in. They can. It doesn't mean that they really have something to bring in. It just means that we allow it, which is going to allow for more opportunities. It really will. But we can't assume this is going to happen. And anyone who tells you that's going to happen, well, I hope they budgeted to give those laptops to kids. Some schools actually do that. There are some schools that do a one-to-one -one initiative and make sure every kid has some type of technology. Some of it goes over remarkably well. Some of it goes over like LA County, which if you've been following what happened with their iPad initiative, it didn't go over so well. Um, they actually bought those iPads from a third party. They didn't buy them from Apple and they paid extra money for custom software. That's where they spent all their money. But moving on. So why would we want to embrace personal electronic devices. Why in the world would we ever want to get rid of that wonderful piece of technology called a copier? How many of you, show of hands, have ever wanted to do this to a copier in your building? More than once. 
I particularly like, now, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but have you seen the movie Office Space? Yes. Mm -hmm. I refer repeatedly when something's not working, where if I say, okay, well, we're going to try to fix it, we're going to call help desk, if we can't fix it, and if none of, nothing works, we're going to have an Office Space moment. <laughs> And sometimes the teacher understands what I'm talking about, and they smile and nod. Sometimes they just get this glazed over expression because they don't watch the same movies that I have watched. Mm -hmm. I actually get the glazed over expression a lot. It's, why don't people watch good movies? I mean, I like them, so they ought to be good. Um, here's the problem with copiers. They're not made for schools. Let me, let me uh, correct that. There are copiers that are made for schools. I had a copier. Not me personally, but the college I went to, one of the colleges I went to, had a copier that was made for schools. It was the length of this room. It had a team of dedicated staff who only worked on that copier. And when you had something that needed to be reproduced for, by them, you approached, you bowed and scraped, you handed them the copy you wanted made, asked them nicely, and then you came back later to pick it up. That copier was maintained very well and never broke down. These copiers here, these are made for offices where you might need to make about 12 copies of a handout to give to people at a staff meeting. Not 30 copies per teacher per day. Why are we killing trees for this? Why are we using toner and ink that costs more than its weight in gold? Let's just print the gold. Yeah. It'll be shiny. It'll distract them with the letters. <sighs> The less of this we can do, the better. And yes, we're not going to get away from this entirely. There will be that kid that doesn't have electronic devices to bring in, and maybe we don't have enough in the classroom to give to them. So we're still going to need some handouts and some worksheets. I hate to say the word worksheets, but we're going to need some of that still. But the more of this we can get rid of, if I know that half of my class has an electronic device, I can give them the electronic version, and I don't have to print as many copies. Yes. This is why it's important. This is why it should be encouraged. Oh, and it's fun and cool and flashy and I'm distracted by shiny things. Okay, therefore, because we're not going to have every single student bringing in their own electronic device, as much as we would love to see that happen, we do have to plan for a wide range of tech. Everything from the, I don't have anything, to the, well, I have this laptop that really wasn't going to be released until next year, but my dad knows a guy. And it, it did solve, you know, it did find a cure for cancer like three times on the way to school today. Um, I, I used the folding at home program and it just you know, folded the proteins until it figured the cure. Um, so we do have to have a plan for no tech, plan B, which plan A should always be using tech because there are ways to use tech in a remarkable way. If plan B is better than plan A for whatever reason, use plan B first, of course. But I'm biased, I teach technology. At the same time, something I frequently say is technology is made to make our lives easier. If you find the technology you're using is making your life harder, somebody's doing something wrong. <coughs> School max! <coughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm coming down with a cold. Um, you will need to use a classroom management system. Some type of system. Usually it's web-based. It's almost always web-based. I'm going to talk more about those later. Uh, to help manage things. You don't have to make it a requirement that every student must use it because, again, plan B, some students don't have access to tech, but it's great to have that available so the student wants to use it. If they can use it, then it makes your life easier, actually, because if you're using one of these, there's no, I lost the paper. There's no, I left it sitting on my desk at home so I wouldn't forget it, and then I walk past it and out the door to the bus. How many of you have done that for something important you had to bring to school that day? Me more than once. Sometimes with my computer, it feels like I have left a body part at home. I've, I'd rather leave my left arm at home than my laptop. I can type with one hand. Okay. Web-based assignments. Again, not every student's going to have this technology, but make it accessible for the ones that do. Your plan B could be a printout of the website. Or if you have enough classroom computers, one might be enough. They could share. They could gather around that one to get the information, or they could have a handout for those students that don't have the technology. Email, raise your hand if you are a PGCPS employee that teaches grades three through 12, anything in between. Your kids have email. I had a student email me before nine o'clock this morning just to say hi. She didn't really have a question. She was, hi, Mr. Smith. Oh, hi. I've had students that were handing in their work via email at 12.03. Yeah. 
a.m. I would have confronted them the next day about why were you up at 12.03 in the morning? I had gone to bed three hours before that. But she was taking a standardized test. So the night before a standardized test, she stayed up late to do work that I had not even given as homework. I gave it to him and I said, this is going to be our classwork next week. So she did it that night. They get excited about it. On one hand, I'm upset that she possibly bombed a standardized test to do my work that I hadn't told her to do. But on the other hand, I hate standardized tests anyway. <laughs> and don't focus on a platform unless you're certain all your kids have that platform. I keep hearing about, oh, this is wonderful iPad app, or this is wonderful Android app, this is wonderful Windows Surface app. Okay, so I never hear that third thing. Um, I, I like how at a conference last year, Microsoft was giving away Windows Surface tablets to everyone, probably because they had this overstock they just could not get rid of any other way and they didn't want to landfill them. Um, Google Drive, oh my gosh. Let me talk to you about the virtues of Google Drive. It is so freaking awesome. Even if your students don't have Gmail accounts, which PG County grades three through 12, unless the parents have opted out, they have an email account. And it's, it's firewall. They can't email anyone outside of the county with that email account, and no one outside of the county can email them. But guess what? I'm inside the county. They can email me. They can email their other teachers. I had some fifth graders where after they got their email accounts, they went to their fifth grade classroom teacher and told her that that's how they were going to be handing in their work from now on. They didn't say, we'd like to hand in our work from this way from now on. They just went to Ms. Robinson and said, we're going to be doing this. Now, I didn't tell them to tell her that. And my public face is I'm upset that they went and gave an ultimatum to their teacher. But inside, I'm just like going, Go forth, my minions. Convert all the Luddites to technology. <laughs> you can look up Luddite if you don't know what that means. OK, so um, even if it's just you using Google Drive, which is free with a Google account, if your county doesn't use Google um, email stuff, well, you can just make your own account. Any handout I give, if it's a permission slip to use Edmodo or any other content management system or anything like that, I have it saved in Google Drive. I actually make the thing in Google Drive these days. If I have someone who insists on me giving them a Microsoft Office document, check this out. Now this was done, whoop. this was done in Google Slides, which is the equivalent of PowerPoint. So if I go to File, and I go down to Download As, the first option, Microsoft PowerPoint. I can import Office documents into here, it'll just work. I can export anything from here to an Office document, it'll just work. I've been doing this instead of using Microsoft Office for years. I don't even have Office installed on this machine and nobody's noticed. It just works. Also, if you happen to have a smart device, I happen to have a Nexus 7 tablet because I'm big on Android, but any smart device that can have the Google Drive app installed, it's a document camera. It's a scanner. I go in, and I can't show you because I can't hook this up to the projector, unfortunately, but I go in, I click the plus button to add a new document, and this is how you want to add it, and there's a bunch of different ways, and one of them is from your camera. I hit the button, it asks me if I want it to be black and white or color or whatnot. I hold it over top of the document I want to scan in, it's got little lines going across so I can try to line it up so it's straight up and down. Hit the button, it says, is this what you want? I say, yes, do you want to add another page? Well, if it's a multi-page document, I want to copy both sides, I say yes, and I keep adding them. Saves it as a PDF file in Google Drive. I can then share that with whoever I want to share it with. It is fantastic, even if you're the only one using it and your students aren't. It's a great way to get all of the stuff that you would normally be handing out to them, wasting all of this paper, and just have it there for them. Yes? It's an Android app? No. Um, I use the Android version, but I'm pretty sure that there's an iOS app as well. well what's, the Android? what's the Android? It would be Google Drive. The Drive app? Oh! Yeah, this is built into Google Drive. So, on my phone too? Yeah. Is that an Android phone? Yeah. There you go. Snap. But I'm pretty sure there's an iOS version as well. Yes? Oh, I was just going to say, with the mirroring thing, there's something called AirDroid that came out recently. You can go to like some in a web browser, mm -hmm. and if, as long as your Android tablet is rooted, you can mirror this, you can mirror your Galaxy 7.
there there's also a way to do screen sharing with the Chrome browser, and right. I very frequently use Firefox instead. But if you're a Chrome person, and I'm not going to hate on you if you use Chrome instead of Firefox. If you use Internet Explorer, it's another story entirely. Mm -hmm. But if you use Chrome or Firefox, both are good. Chrome does have the same feature that you're talking about, and is very nice. I've seen Selena Ward geek out about that on a few occasions. Oh, did I just name drop? I name dropped. <laughs> I will do that again. Okay, so digital citizenship, which I said I've got to talk about every time I talk about doing anything that involves the internet, particularly if your students are going to be posting anything on the internet, we got to talk about digital citizenship because they know the how. Some of them don't know the how, but they learn the how. I want to do X. Here's X. This is a cool thing. I will do X, but they don't ask, should I be doing that cool thing? Should I be downloading all those videos off of YouTube? and then uploading them somewhere else. Should I be taking a song that I like that was made by a signed album producer or whatever and sharing it with all my friends on the internet? Should I take that image off of Google image search and just post it somewhere else without attribution? They don't know the why or why not. They don't know how to act on the internet yet. They are a generation where technology has progressed so fast that the older generation, unless they've been really paying attention, because like me, they are distracted by shiny things all the time, they're left behind. And they're like, well, the kids are smart enough to figure it out, so I'll let them figure it out. Well, they figure it out, but don't figure out the ethics behind it. So they have all this power, and they don't realize they've also got responsibility to go with it. And one bad apple, that's why I like this picture, one bad apple can ruin it for the entire class as I've seen happen. Uh, there was an instance a couple of years ago using Edmodo with elementary school where one person decided to post some not nice things on Edmodo. And I check Edmodo frequently and when I catch these things it's a teachable moment and I deal with it with the student. But before I caught this, because it was posted, I, if I remember correctly, it was posted late at night. And by the time I woke up in the morning, there was already a parent who had gone on someone else, another student's Edmodo account. Um, now, parents can't have parent Edmodo accounts where they can see what their child is doing, but they can't see what other children are doing. If they go on the student's Edmodo account, they can see everything the student can see, including what other students are typing. And the parent was not mad at his child. The parent was mad that some other child had posted something that was inappropriate and was very upset that his child was allowed to use such a service that would allow some other child to say something. Um, so. That was a wonderful teachable moment with the students the next time I had them. Main thing to do is you pick a classroom management system that is a social media. You don't just have them use a social media. I have seen some classrooms where they do remarkably well by having every student sign up for a Twitter account, and that's how they converse, and they have a hashtag. Well, that's fine if you're dealing with older students. Perhaps college level would work great for that. I teach at a K-8 academy. I got plenty of kids that have Twitter accounts. I'm not having them do that. Um, Edmodo is great because you have full moderation privileges. You can turn it off on a student by student basis, or you can turn it off for the entire class. Or you can turn it on for the entire class. Or you can turn it on during class time and then turn it off when class is over. And that's just one classroom management system. There's more that are out there. Um, again, we'll talk about more about it later. Show best practices. Post a lot to the content management system. Post the kind of things that you would like to see other students posting. And they'll learn from you by what you're doing. Students are great mimics, as we've all learned the hard way. <laughs> and the nice way, too. Um, yes, moderate when needed. When there's a slip up, turn it into a teachable moment. Don't just say, well, that's wrong. PS74, you're, you got a referral, you're going to be in school suspension, yada, yada, yada. Have a classroom discussion on it. If someone's harassing someone else, turn it into a classroom discussion. How did you feel when someone said this about you? A lot of times, when someone is doing stuff like that, they think that the other person will know they're only joking. Movie aliens, in space no one can hear you scream. On the internet, no one knows it's a joke. And even if it is a joke, you know, when, when I was in middle school and I got kicked down the stairs, the students who did the kicking said they were only joking around. That made me feel totally better about falling down a flight of stairs, let me tell you. Oh, wait. No, it didn't. 
they don't realize that until you have the discussion, and it can be a great aha moment. When is the session over? Like 1.30. Okay, so good. You're stuck with me a little bit longer. <laughs> this is my favorite teachable moment recently. Uh, this was a fourth grade class where I let them loose on Edmodo for 24 hours. Didn't moderate it at all for 24 hours. And then I took everything they posted and I threw it into Wordle. How many of you are familiar with Wordle? Wordle.net is so incredibly awesome if you have lessons to go with it. I usually have the students use it and make their own Wordles. In this case, I made it for them. And I just had this be on the screen when they came in. And I said, this is what you wrote. And the more often a word was used, the larger it appeared. Look at the fantastic conversations they had for the first 24 hours of using Edmodo. Hey! Hi! And everything else is much smaller. They weren't really saying anything useful at all. And there were a few people who were trying to say some useful stuff, but it got drowned out in the haze. And I, I do admit I did some editing. I cut out some of the haze where they held down on the Y key for like five minutes. There's a few that got in here. There's one hey here that has three Ys behind it, but you get the idea. Now, this is not what we should expect from our students getting on social media. Cat-like typing has been detected, whether it is pressing random letters. Because I pressed them, they showed up on the screen, and now I can send them to somebody else. It's magic! Arthur C. Clarke was right! And like two people in this room got the reference. None of my students would. Um, for the record, Arthur C. Clarke once said that um, sufficiently advanced technology is indecipherable. Well, it's indistinguishable from magic. Um, that's my cat, by the way. I really just wanted an excuse to put a photo of my cat in the photo, <laughs> in, in the presentation. His, his name is Socrates. We call him Socket because he's wired. And I just caught him using my Twitter account. Okay. So I don't know where Think showed up first. Every time I find a site that uses it, I'm like, oh great, I'm going to find where they got it from. I found it on Pinterest. That's not a source. That's a repository for copyright infringement. <laughs> it's like saying, well, I found it on Google. The entire internet's on Google. But it's very useful. Just have your students think about, okay, before you write that, before you hit the send button or the post button, does it fit at least one of these categories? It doesn't need to hit every single one of them, but it's got to hit at least one. If hey is inspiring, well, I'd love to hear their case for it. But they are required to think. More than zero thinking will be required in my classroom. Go figure, I'm a teacher. OK, let's move on to quizzes and tests. I'll give you a moment to read what's on the board. I hate quizzes. I hate tests. They're not my favorite kind of assessment. My background is visual arts. That's my certification. That's what I did for years before I traded my paintbrushes for a computer lab. I gave quizzes and tests then because I had to. I give quizzes and tests now because I have to. But I'm all about the project-based learning. However, if you are doing something that requires a quiz or a test, you don't have to give it on paper. Here's some examples. TestMoz is my favorite. It's not the flashiest. It's not the fanciest. But TestMoz.com does, it's free. That's a key word. I love that word. It's free. It does everything I needed to do. It does multiple choice. It can do fill in the blank, but be careful because you have to write exactly what you want the students to write. And if they don't write exactly what you put, it gets marked wrong. If you write it and you don't capitalize it and they capitalize it, congratulations, it's the wrong answer. Now, you could put in multiple versions of what you'd accept, capitalized and uncapitalized. That's on up to you. It's great for multiple choice, true, false, etc. It's great for randomizing the question order and the answer order. You can turn that off because the questions would say all the above don't make much sense if that's the first option. <laughs> it just isn't. Um, so you can turn it off on a case by case basis. And what I really love about it is when the student hits submit, it tells them their score immediately. Instant feedback. I also have it turned on. It's a setting you can turn on or off. 
where it tells them which ones they got right and which ones they got wrong. I have a system that if they got it right, it tells them the answer they put that was right. And if they got it wrong, it tells them the answer they put that was wrong. I'm not giving them the answers. They got to find that on their own. And what my personal strategy in my classroom is, I treat it like a video game. They can keep handing things in until they get an A. So I let them take the test over and over again, or the quiz over and over again, until they earn that A. What they do is they look at the answers they got right. They know that answer is correct. They're going to answer the same way the next time. Look at the answers they got wrong. Well, that rules out one of the possibilities. They're not going to pick that next time if they're doing it right. Um, Edmodo has a built-in quiz builder as well. Edmodo is nice because it allows you to add media files into it. So you can say, well, look at this picture and then reply to this picture or what an answer based on the picture or a movie or whatever. Kahoot, we used that today during the keynote. So I'm not going to talk about that too much because I'm running short on time. Uh, Discovery Education, <coughs> which if you are in a county that does Discovery Education streaming, which PG County does, hence the keynote speaker works for Discovery Education streaming, uh, they have something, it's actually called the Builders, where you can do quizzes as well. You can add media from Discovery Education streaming in there, which is very nice. I don't use that in particular because it's a little iffy on how to set up the student accounts for that. There was a push for that in Bonnie John's several years ago, but I don't know what's happened since then. Uh, Google Forms is great. I use Google Forms a lot for warm-ups, where I just have them have one thing be write your name, and the next thing be, okay, answer this question. And that's the warm-up, and they submit it, and it's time-stamped. So when I see that the student handed in the warm-up at 12.55, when the bell rings for dismissal, I know they weren't really doing the warm-up. They were putting it off, and I can grade accordingly. Um, the problem with Google Forms was it didn't do grading for you. You still had to go in manually and say, okay, that was right, that was right, that was wrong, that was right. Um, there were ways, because it's a spreadsheet, it puts all the answers in a spreadsheet for you, to go in and have it color code or do an if-then statement to give a score. And that's how I always did it in the past. And then lo and behold, last night I get an email from Google that says, oh, by the way, you should try Fubaru, which other, other sessions today have talked about too. Fluberu, you add that in, you answer the quiz once with all the correct answers, it uses that as the answer key and it'll grade all your student work for you, and you can have it email the scores to the students, or email them to you, or put them in chart form. Really cool. Classroom management systems, because the more we can get away from huge stacks of paper, the better. When I was a visual arts teacher, I had to carry so many huge stacks of paper, and it was not worth it. And I, was, I had gone into a profession where their job was to create art on huge stacks of paper. Exams were the worst. There are ways around it. First of all, going paperless with a classroom management system, that's the key thing to do it. Like I've talked about before, um, copies break down. It gets very hard as the year goes on to find that paper. There were some teachers in my building that would take their their extra paper and they put it in their mailbox because that was right next to the copier and then it would disappear. Not that anyone in a school would be so ingenious as to take the paper out of someone else's mailbox and use it without replacing it. <coughs> Copiers break down, um, paper gets lost, paper gets torn up. I buy students hand in projects where the paper looked like it had been taped together three different times and not in the right order. You don't have to worry about that with a classroom management system. But here's the biggest reason to use a classroom management system. Friends don't let friends use worksheets. <laughs> they don't like them. I don't like grading them. There are other ways around it. OK, so again, Edmodo, I keep coming back to that, because Edmodo can be a one-stop shop for you. It is something that the county likes to use. Up until this year, they kept talking about it every year. They stopped talking about this year because Google Classroom came out, and that's the new Shiny. Mm. And I'm not the only one distracted by Shiny things. I'm using both of them right now. I'm using Edmodo with my year-long students. I have just started using Google Classroom with my nine-week elective students. They both have their benefits and drawbacks. Um, Google Classroom, I found when I'm submitting things, is not quite as responsive as Edmodo, but it allows for people to hand in larger files. Since my students are doing a lot of video editing, and taking, like I've got a second quarter project for my year-long students where they got to take 200 photos. Mm -hmm. That is a pain to hand in on Edmodo. Mm -hmm. They put them all into a Google Drive folder, they share it with me in Google Classroom, they're done. This is great for bulk. 
Um, Schoology is something that I've heard talked about more than once. I don't personally use it. However, the best content management system for you, if there are multiple teachers in your building already using one, that's the best one for you because the students will already know what to do. And you won't have to teach them how to use the classroom management system. They'll already know. It'll be great. Um, three ring is great for handing in files, even including large files. I was considering using it this year. Um, Blackboard is a horrible piece of code that should be burned to the ground and then have the earth salted where it stood. <laughs> I'm only a little biased. Okay, maybe not a little. Um, three ring isn't great for grading things, but it's great for them to get you files, which is good. Great way for them to hand stuff in, including like I was doing Google Drive where I say you could take a photo of it. So even if they did have a paper worksheet, if they're using Google Drive, Google Classroom, they could take a photograph of their work and hand it in and you'd be able to grade it that way. Um, when I first start, started using classroom management systems, I grew my own. I used, um, I haven't used Moodle with students. I had played with Moodle. It's open source and as long as you have a server, like DreamHost is cheap, it's like seven bucks a month. Um, you can install that and it's a full-fledged classroom management system that you can tweak as much as you want. I used WordPress for years. It's a blogging service. But one WordPress install allows you to have multiple accounts. So I had one master account that had admin rights and I had a bunch of student accounts. And when they handed in work, they just uploaded it as a blog post. A bunch of different ways. You can grow your own or if, if, if you're like me and you like pressing buttons or if you want something that's already done for you. At Moto, I highly recommend Google Classroom. It has some good points. You can try out the rest of them. Try more than one. Make an account on everything. See what you like. Yes? Um, do this have Google Classroom have an annotate function? The way Evernote um, does? Um, yes, because what's going on is if you are in Google Classroom, uh, they're handing in work. They have to have a Google account to do that. So they're having the file be in Google Drive already. Gotcha. And Google Drive, gotcha. you can actually go up to insert and go down to comment. And you can add comments on the side, or you can suggest changes. And you can send that back to them. And the great thing about that is, for a moto, I just had to go back every week and check and see if they had actually looked at the comments. Mm -hmm. For Google Classroom and Google Drive, if they make a change, there's a little button next to each comment I leave that says resolved. They click on that button. I get an email that says, they've marked this as resolved. I can go check immediately to see if they fixed it properly or if they only capitalized that proper noun in one spot and left it uncapitalized in the rest of the five-page report. Mm -hmm. Oh, I might be a little bitter about that. Um, I require my students to write on a sixth grade level and I think capitalization is not yet sixth grade, I think it's below that. Okay, so project-based learning is awesome. I'm not gonna play the video for you because of how close we are to the end time, but if you can give your students a way of showing what they've learned other than fill out this worksheet or take this test, do it. They will be more interested they will have better retention. Have them build something. Have them make something. It doesn't even need to be on the computer. It does not. It could be, and they could build it out of cardboard and popsicle sticks for all I care. If they're showing something that demonstrates what they've learned in your classroom with something other than a number two pencil and little bubbles, it's worthwhile. Now, if you do want to go the number two pencil and little bubbles route, it's not in this presentation because I think I may have forgotten to add it, but there's a website called GradeCam, gradecam.com. It's basically making your own Scantron, but it's really cool because it's graded by them coming up to your computer and using your computer's webcam or document camera and just holding up their answer sheet, and it goes bing, and it tells them their score. Yes? Um, we had a, a, a presentation on GradeCam and found out you can use your visualizer as well. Yes. A any document camera. Visualizer is actually a brand name for document camera. But yes, it's like Kleenex. Brand name that people just use for tissue. Um, so exactly right. And what I love most about GradeCam is not the wonderful charts it shows you for who understood which question and stuff like that. Because you can get that in other things like test mods. It's that if they haven't filled the bubbles in right, that was always my terror whenever I did a standardized test. Did I fill the bubble all the way? Did I er erase that wrong answer completely? Oh my gosh, is that a stray mark? What will I? Oh no, it's a hair. Um, if it doesn't quite read it right, you get a pop-up that says, I'm not sure about this answer. And they click on the bubbles on the screen that they meant to put. And then they go through and it tells them their score. Instant gratification. And oh, by the way, it logs everything for you. It still uses paper, 
And, but it's great for any school that's not at a one-to-one -one ratio. It doesn't have them using the technology. You're still using it, but it, it's useful. Um, so QR codes. These are great, particularly if your students are bringing cell phones. QR code readers are free. There's ones out there you can pay money for. Don't bother. I saw one on my um, Nexus 7 today because I realized I'd forgotten to do that. Um, which, great thing about QR codes, all they are is a web address. That's really all they are. If you've got a class site, and if you've got a Google account, you've got a Google Sites account, you can make your own website for free. You don't even need to have a, a readable URL. It could be incredibly long. I do recommend using a URL shortener, like tiny URLs not blocked in the county, there's a bunch that are. But what happens is if you put that long URL through a URL shortener, like tiny URL, it'll still get them where they want to go, but it'll be a shorter address. And that means the squares on here will be larger, which means it'll be easier for the QR code reader to read it. But you can bypass that step entirely if you want to. Um, if you are an accounting that blocks everything known to man, <coughs> Um, then you just have to deal with what you have to deal with. Um, I've seen setups where what they did was the students wrote book reports and they had little signs with QR codes for each book report which was put up on a Google site, a separate Google site page, and they were stuck to the bookshelves. So if a student wanted to see if a book was worth reading, they would scan the QR code and it would take them to a book report written by another student. I've seen scavenger hunts where they had to go around the school and find the QR codes and scan them, and each scavenger hunt gave them a question that had to do with the curriculum. They had to answer that question, and the first team to come back with all the questions answered would get some kind of prize. Wonderful game-based learning. Um, I've seen a wide variety of QR code uses in this county, as well as other counties, including possession evaluations. So if you scan this QR code, and it's also on the wall over there, with any device that has a QR code reader on it, it'll take you to the evaluation for this session. Um, Remember this one was called Bring on the PED, and you can say how horrible it was and how you're never coming back here again. Um, it does have you rate on a scale of really good to really bad, and then you can leave a comment at the end. Uh, and if you need a paper copy, I have them. Yes, you, you can, if you want to honor the sacrifice of the dead trees <laughs> that died to evaluate me, <laughs> you can do that. It's all good. But you um, fail because you're not using no, no, no. <laughs> it's, um, remember, technology is made to like make our lives easier. If you don't have a QR code reader, if you didn't bring an electronic device with you that has access to the internet for one reason or another, the paper device works just fine. Anybody want one? Yes. Question. Answer. Um, do you have any, um, like, things like Kahoot it? Anything that's just like, here's a super cool thing you can use with your kids to do. Um, I've, if they, I've if played with a, a, Let's say they all run a smartphone. What kinds of like cool new things have you seen, even if you haven't tried them? You're putting me on the spot here. I but know, I'm sorry. photography lessons. Not sorry. Photography lessons are my big thing. I've taught photography for years. I love photography. I think digital photography is the best thing that's ever happened to photography. Even though I miss the dark room and playing with all those dangerous, hazardous chemicals, for some reason they let me, don't let me do that in middle school. Um, but I'll teach rule of thirds lessons. I'll teach digital storytelling. I'll teach. Okay, well, here's how you capture a motion shot. Here's how to stabilize that cell phone where, you know, all those blurry shots you've been getting? Here's how to make sure you never get a blurry shot again. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have them hidden the photos using the Edmodo app or okay. Google Drive as a way of getting their work to me. Um, because I happen to teach at an arts academy, that's the main thing I do. I don't do Kahoot, uh, sorry, Kahoot it so much because I'm very big on students being able to pick their own projects. It's part of my gamification stuff that I do. And I don't want the entire class to have to wait for everyone to answer a question before we move on, and that's what Kahoot it does. If you're assessing the entire class at once, if that's what your curriculum allows for and that's what you want to do, I'm not gonna knock it. Right. But it's not how I want to teach my class. The reason I've given all these options instead of saying, this is the one and all be all, is because your results may vary. May, I'm sorry, your results may vary See a doctor before trying. If death results, call a doctor. Um, you get the idea. Any other questions? Fantastic. Well, OK, so we need to bug out of here before the next presenter comes in. That presenter is me. <laughs> I'm already here, and I will be presenting. But if, if you've already seen this session, you don't have to stay. We'll miss you. 
We really will. Please promise to write. Follow me on Twitter. I'm the art guy. Um, Have you ever used VoiceThread? VoiceThread, I've played with it. Um, I did when it was free. That too. Cost money. It, yeah. I don't even remember what half the things where they were free and then they've gone to paid, to be honest. Um, if I have audio files I want to give the students, I can upload them to Google Drive and show them that way. I can put them on a Google site. There's like 15 different ways to share an audio file. Actually, there's a lot more than 15. Well, it, it does audio and video and lets you um, like draw on, yep, look pictures oh, yeah. and draw on it. And I use YouTube things. for that. Um, because YouTube is not blocked in Prince George's County, and yes, I will brag about that. Um, what I actually it do is... It is blocked in other counties. Oh, I'm, I know it well, certainly is. But since it is not blocked here, I get to use it. Now, instead of using YouTube, there's also SchoolTube, there's TeacherTube, there's other sources out there where you can host video. Even Google Drive will, hold, will host video. So there's a billion different ways to upload a video file because YouTube is there and it works. I use it. Um, I do like the privacy settings I can set for it where I can have it to be unlisted. So only people who I share the link with get to see it or I can have it be public. Um, yes, Google Drive actually has better privacy settings than YouTube does. Does it have better than Edmodo? Um, Edmodo has a limit on the size file you can upload. After you get past 100 megabytes, which with video you're frequently going to get over 100 megabytes, um, it will not tell you that it won't upload it. It will still give you that little rotating thing saying, I'm uploading, I'm uploading, I'm uploading. But you come back a week later and it's still saying that. It just stalls. So what I do if I want to share a video with students via Edmodo, I'll upload it to Google Drive. Yeah. I'll set it so that anyone with the link can find it, but it's not searchable. And I'll share that link with them on Edmodo. Yeah, okay. Any good suggestions for first graders? For first grade? Yeah, we, got, um, we have like cart iPads and stuff that we can check out. Okay, so that's about drawing programs are things. great. Would so. Yeah, get a, any program that allows them to draw mm -hmm. is fantastic. Um, look for us. I like, like the story creation program. With that can that can work too. Um, I'm a big fan of step sequencers, where they basically you got a grid of dots, and as you tap the dots, it plays music and it rotates through all of them over and over again. So because you have the repetition, no matter what they press, it sounds good. Mm -hmm. Except what will happen is. All, the, all your first graders will tap every single dot and they'll come over to you and say, look, I hit them all! Yeah. And then what you say is, okay, well, how does it sound? Not so good, okay. Can you, what would you have to do to make it sound better? Which dots would you remove to make it sound better? And now they're experimenting with it. Whatever technology you have them use, give them one day where all they do is play with it. Yeah. What's gonna happen is within five minutes or less, most likely, you will have one kid looking over another kid's shoulder that goes, oh, how did you do that? And then that first kid is suddenly in the role of the teacher, and they share what they did with the other student. Because they're not, almost never going to say, well, I don't know. They're going to say, well, I did this. And now one student is teaching another student, and it's going to spread. And they're going to have a day of exploratory learning, which is how kids learn. They don't read the manuals. They don't have manuals that come with video games anymore. They don't even bother to print them. They learn because they play with the user interface. They experiment with it. They, they build a hypothesis. Well, pressing this button might make me jump. Oh. That doesn't work. Therefore, that hypothesis is false. How about this button? Oh, I jumped. Have you ever seen the TED Talk where they put um, a computer in some rural? Yes. In India. Yes, and it the was kids awesome. Learn, learn English and computer. Not not only English, but he had them covering complex topics like yeah. mutation over multiple generations. Yeah. It and they, they they were actually frustrated. Like, we, oh, aside from learning that there's mutations when you have multiple generations breeding, we haven't learned anything. These kids are the equivalent of third graders. They've learned a lot. <laughs> and it's fantastic. Yes. So, yes. Um, can we scan this uh, QR code? Is that for all four sessions? It's, this, it's, it's, it's the, the same one. For it's three the same of them. All, it's the same one. Except it, for the last the, one. The last one will be this same QR code for the session itself, but there'll be another QR code on the other side, which will be for the conference overall. Okay. And submitting that one. That will show you a screen that you then take it to the, the giver the of grand tickets. Yes. And they okay. will give you the ticket to explain. So I can, maybe I can go ahead and scan press. this and do my other two sessions that I have over there. Exactly. You just okay. hit the back arrow and submit and you pick a different session for the name. Perfect. Okay, thank you. All right.